Alrighty, welcome back to Free Read Fridays. I'm your intrepid narrator, Fragath, and today we continue reading The Fall of Hyperion by Dan Simmons. Previously on... Um, Keats slash Joseph Severn Cybrid has tuberculosis slash consumption. Um, Lay Hunt has no idea what to do about this because he is not a trained medical professional. And TB, tuberculosis, has been out of circulation for uh, quite some time uh, by the time this has rolled around. So even if he knew what to do, there wouldn't be much he could do about it. Uh, also, the fact that he's in like 1800s era uh, Italy, or at least a recreation thereof, isn't, isn't necessarily helping either. Uh, let's see. The consul has been saved by Theo Lane. Uh, he gets to his ship. And uh, before he takes off, he has to take a message from Mina Gladstone, which tells him in no uncertain terms, hey, you're not going to be able to go back to the pilgrims. First of all, what could you possibly do that could help, even with the ship? You can't put Rachel, baby Rachel into stasis. It's too late anyway. Um and, uh, and frankly, they're probably all dead, if we're being honest. Uh, also, if you try flying over there, you'll probably get killed en route, uh, either due to the giant shooting war happening uh, in orbit and on the ground of Hyperion, but also because the Shrike eats manned spacecraft flying over specific areas. Uh, well, eats the people, or disappears the people, anyway. Um... So she says, here's an ultimatum, though. You can make yourself useful. Uh, you can be a diplomat. You can be a diplomatic liaison between us and the ousters that are attacking. Um, you can maybe get them to dial it back some. And he's like, well, I guess I don't really have a choice. Oh, uh, Emilio, Emilio Arundes is uh, with him as well, because we might as well get all the named characters involved in the script at this point. <laughs> That's basically why he's there. <laughs> Make no mistake. Also to have an archaeologist's take on the ousters when we get there. Uh, if we get there. Ooh, shadow of a doubt. Um, so I think that's most of it. Uh, Fedman Kassad is still fighting the Shrike. It's um, it's not going terribly. I mean, he's still alive, so so that's that's something. <laughs> uh, the Shrike could probably no sell him effortlessly, but uh, that would be cheating, and this is a moderately honorable fight, a duel. Uh, even though Moneta has now chipped in and is helping. Okay, so I think we've got our chunklet set aside here. It's not super long, but it's long enough. Uh, I may have to cut it off early because it is uh, raining, and it has been raining, and it the river level near where I am is pretty high, and I may have to run and move the car uh, so that it does not get flooded and or swamped. Uh, hopefully that will not be necessary, but I do have a, a nice USGS.gov uh, thing up and running here to keep an eye on the water level. Um, alrighty, uh, with that I'm going to get cracking, and uh, yeah, hopefully people enjoy. That's the hope and the dream. Do, do, do. Oh, thanks for tuning in, Warren Steele. I don't know how I only just saw the message now. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. The other thing is that Mina Gladstone is confronting the core and saying, excuse me, what the fuck is going on? What is wrong with you creatures? She also has some leverage uh, that she's going to make known. Um, but hasn't yet. Um, oh, and Father Paul DeRay got off of God's Grove, the forest planet, safely. Uh, the forest planet is being raised. It is being burned to the ground. So these invading ouster fleets seem to be uh, taking zero prisoners. Anyway, let's get cracking.
Chapter 39 The two rooms on the second floor of the house on the Piazza di Spagna are small, narrow, high-ceilinged, and, except for a single dim lamp burning in each room as if lighted by ghosts in expectation of a visit by other ghosts, quite dark. My bed is in the smaller of the two rooms, the one facing the, the, one facing the piazza, although all one can see from the high windows, this... Uh, my bed is in the smaller of the two rooms, the one facing the piazza, although all one can see from the high windows this night is darkness creased by deeper shadows and accented by the ceaseless burbling of Bernini's unseen fountain. Bells ring on the hour from one of the twin towers of Santa Trini Trinita. Oh, geez, that is a long name. A uh, longer name than I thought. Sorry. Bells ring on the hour from one of the twin towers of Santa Trinita dei Monti, the church that, crouch, that crouches in the dark like a massive, tawny cat at the head of the stairs outside, and each time I hear the bells toll the brief notes of the early hours of the morn, I imagine ghostly hands pulling rotting bell ropes. Or perhaps rotting hands pull pulling ghosty bell ropes. I don't know which image suits my macabre fancies this endless night. Fever lies upon me this night, as dank and heavy and stifling as a thick, water-soaked blanket. My skin alternately burns and then is clammy to the touch. Twice I have been seized with coughing spasms. The first brought Hunt running in from his couch in the other room, and I watched his eyes widen at the sight of the blood I had vomited on the damask sheets. The second spasm I stifled as best I could, staggering to the basin on the bureau to spit up smaller quantities of black blood and dark phlegm. Hunt did not wake the second time. To be back here. To come all this way to these dark rooms, this grim bed. I half remember awakening here, miraculously cured the real Severn and Dr. Clark and even little Signora Angeletti hovering in the outer room. That period of convalescence from death, that period of realization that I was not Keats, was not on the true earth, that this was not in the century I had closed my eyes in, that I had closed my eyes in that last night, that I was not human. Sometime after two, I sleep, and as I sleep, I dream. The dream is one I have never suffered before. I dream that I rise slowly through the datum plane, through the datasphere, into and through the megasphere, and finally into a place I do not know, have never dreamt of, a place with infinite spaces, unhurried, indescribable colours. A place with no horizons, no ceilings, no floors or solid areas one might call the ground. I think of it as the metasphere, for I sense immediately that this level of consensual reality includes all of the varieties and vagaries of sensation which I have experienced on earth, all of the binary ana analyses and intellectual pleasures I have felt flowing from the technocore through the datasphere, and, above all, a sense of... of what? Expansiveness? Freedom? Potential might be the word I am hunting for. I am alone in this metasphere. Colours flow above me, under me, through me, sometimes dissolving into vague pastels, sometimes coalescing into cloud-like fantasies, and at other times, rarely, appearing to form into more solid objects, shapes, distinct forms which may or may not be humanoid in appearance. I watch them the way a child might watch clouds and imagine elephants, crocodiles from the Nile, and great gunboats marching from west to east on a spring day in the Lake District. After a while I hear sounds, the maddening trickle of the Bernini fountain in the piazza outside, doves rustling and cooing on the ledges above my window, lay Hunt moaning softly in his sleep. But above and beneath these noises I hear something more stealthy, less real, but infinitely more threatening. Something large this way comes. I strain to see through the pastel gloom. Something is moving just beyond the horizon of sight. I know that it knows my name. 
I know that it holds my life in one palm and death in its other fist. There is no place to hide in this space beyond space. I cannot run. The siren song of pain continues to rise and fall from the world I left behind, the everyday pain of each person everywhere, the pain of those suffering from the war just begun, the specific focused pain of those on the Shrike's terrible tree, and, worst of all, the pain I feel for and from the pilgrims and those others whose lives and thoughts I now share. We'll get the page flipped eventually. Jeez Louise, there we go. <laughs> it would be worth rushing to greet this approaching shadow of doom if it would grant me freedom from that song of pain. Severn! Severn! For a second, I think that I am the one calling, just as I had before in these rooms, calling Joseph Severn in the night when my pain and fever ranged beyond my ability to contain it. And he was always there, Severn, with his hulking, well-meaning slowness, and that gentle smile which I often wanted to wipe from his face with some small meanness or comment. It is hard to be good-natured when one is dying. I had led a life of some generosity. Why, then, was it my fate to continue that role when I was the one suffering, when I was the one coughing the ragged remnants of my lungs into stained handkerchiefs? Severn! It is not my voice. Hunt is shaking me by the shoulders, calling Severn's name. I realize he thinks he is calling my name. I brush away his hands and sink back into the pillows. What is it? What's wrong? You were moaning, says Gladstone's aide, crying out. A nightmare, <clears throat> nothing more. Your dreams are usually more than dreams, says Hunt. He glances around the narrow room, illuminated now by the single lamp he has carried in. What a terrible place, Severn. I try to smile. It cost me twenty-eight shillings a month, seven scudi, highway robbery. Hunt frowns at me. The stark light makes his wrinkles seem deeper than usual. Listen, Severn, I know you're a cybrid. Gladstone told me that you were the retrieval persona of a poet named Keats. Now, obviously, all this... He gestured helplessly toward the room, shadows, tall rectangle of windows, and high bed. All this has something to do with that. But how? What game is the Corps playing here? I'm not sure. I say truthfully. But you know this place? Oh, yes, I say with feeling. Tell me, pleads Hunt, and it is his, restra and it is his restraint to this point in not asking as much as the earnestness of that plea now, which decides me to tell him. I tell him about the poet John Keats, about his birth in 1795, his short and frequently unhappy life, and about his death from consumption in 1821, in Rome, far from his friends and only love. I tell him about my staged recovery in this very room, about my decision to take the name of Joseph Severn, the artist acquaintance who stayed with Keats until his death, and, finally, I tell him about my short time in the web, listening, watching, condemned to dream the lives of the Shrike pilgrims on Hyperion and the others. Dreams? says Hunt. You mean even now you're dreaming about what's occurring in the web? Yes. I tell him of the dreams about Gladstone, the destruction of Heaven's Gate and God's Grove, and the confused images from Hyperion. Hunt is pacing back and forth in the narrow room, his shadow thrown high on the rough walls. Can you contact them? The ones I dream of? Gladstone? I think a second. No. Are you sure? I try to explain. I'm not even in these dreams, Hunt. I have no, no voice, no presence. There's no way I can contact those I dream about. But sometimes you dream what they're thinking? 
I realize that this is true, close to the truth. I sense what they are feeling. Then can't you leave some trace in their mind, in their memory? Let them know where we are? No. Hunt collapses into the chair at the foot of my bed. He suddenly seems very old. Lay, I say, even if I could communicate with Gladstone or the others, which I can't, what good would it do? I've told you that this replica of old Earth is in the Magellanic Cloud. Even at quantum leap, hawking velocities, it would take centuries for anyone to reach us. We could warn them, says Hunt, his voice so tired that it sounds almost sullen. Warn them of what? All of Gladstone's worst nightmares are coming true around her. Do you think she trusts the core now? That's why the Corps could kidnap us so blatantly. Events are proceeding too quickly for Gladstone or anyone in the hegemony to deal with. Hunt rubs his eyes, then steeples his fingers under his nose. His stare is not overly friendly. Are you really the, retrie the retrieved personality of a poet? I say nothing. Recite some poetry. Make something up. I shake my head. It is late. We're both tired and frightened, and my heart has not yet quit pounding from the nightmare which was more than a nightmare. I won't let Hunt make me angry. Come on, he says. Show me what you show me that you are the new, improved version of Bill Keats. John Keats, I say softly. Whatever. Come on, Severn, or John, or whatever I should call you. Recite some posy. All right, I say, returning his stare. Listen. There was a naughty boy, and a naughty boy was he, for nothing would he do but scribble poetry. He took an inkstand in his hand, and a pen, big as ten, in the other, and away in a pother he ran to the mountains, and fountains, and ghosts, and posts, and witches, and ditches, and wrote in his coat, when the weather was cool, fear of gout, and without, when the weather was warm. Oh, the charm, when we choose to follow one's nose, to the north, to the north, to follow one's nose, to the north. I don't know, says Hunt. That doesn't sound like something a poet whose reputation has lasted a thousand years would have written. I shrug. Were you dreaming about Gladstone tonight? Did something happen that caused those moans? No, it wasn't about Gladstone. It was a real nightmare for a change. Hunt stands, lifts his lamp, and prepares to take the only light from the room. I can hear the fountain in the piazza, the doves on the window sills. Tomorrow, he says, we'll make sense of all this and figure out a way to get back. If they can forecast us here, there must be a way to forecast home. Yes, I say, knowing it is not true. Good night, says Hunt. No more nightmares, all right? No more, I say, knowing this is even less true. Moneta pulled the wounded Kassad away from the shrike and seemed to hold the creature at bay with an extended hand while she fumbled a blue torus from the belt of her skin suit and twisted it behind her. A two-meter-high gold oval hung burning in midair. Let me go, muttered Kassad. Let us finish it. There was blood spattered where the Shrike had clawed huge rents in the colonel's skin suit. His right foot was dangling as if half-severed. He could put no weight on it, and, the on and only the fact that he had been struggling with the Shrike, half-carried by the thing in a mad parody of a dance, had kept Kassad upright as they fought. "'Let me go,' repeated Fedman Kassad. "'Shut up,' said Moneta, and then, more softly, "'Shut up, my love.' She dragged him through the golden oval, and they emerged into blazing light. 
even though his pain and even through sorry even through his pain and exhaustion cassad was dazzled by the sight they were not on hyperion he was sure of that a vast plain stretched to an horizon much farther away than logic or experience would allow low orange grass if grass it was grew on the flatlands and low hills like fuzz on the back of some immense caterpillar while things which might have been trees grew like whiskered carbon sculptures their trunks and branches escher-ish in their baroque improbability their leaves a riot of dark blue and violet ovals shimmering toward a sky alive with light but not sunlight even as moneta carried him away from the closing portal cassad did not think of it as a farcaster since he felt sure it had carried them through time as well as space and toward a copse of those impossible trees cassad turned his eyes towards the sky and felt something close to wonder it was as bright as a hyperion day as bright as midday on a lucian so shopping mall as bright as midsummer on the tharsis plateau of cassad's dry homeworld mars but this was no sunlight the sky was filled with stars and constellations and star clusters and a galaxy so cluttered with suns that there were almost no patches of darkness between the lights it was like being in a planetarium with ten projectors thought cassad like being at the center of the galaxy the center of the galaxy a group of men and women in skin suits moved out from the shade of the escher trees to circle cassad and moneta one of the men a giant even by cassad's martian standards looked at him raised his head toward moneta and even though cassad could hear nothing sense nothing on his skin suits radio and tight and tight band receivers he knew the two were communicating lie back said moneta as she laid cassad on the velvety orange grass he struggled to sit up, to speak, but both she and the giant touched his chest with their palms, and he lay back so that his vision was filled with the slowly twisting violet leaves and the sky of, of stars. The man touched him again, and Cassad's skin suit was deactivated. He tried to sit up, tried to cover himself as he realized he was naked before the small crowd that had gathered, but Moneta's firm hand held him in place through the pain and dislocation he vaguely sensed the man touching his slashed arms and chest running a silver-coated hand down to his, down his leg to where the achilles tendon had been cut the colonel felt a coolness wherever the giant touched and then his consciousness floated away like a balloon high above the tawny plain and the rolling hills drifting toward the solid canopy of stars where a huge figure waited dark as a towering thundercloud above the horizon massive as a mountain cassad whispered moneta and the colonel drifted back cassad she said again her lips against his cheek her his skin suit reactivated and melding with hers reactivating reactivated and melded with hers sorry tenses matter colonel fedman cassad sat up as she did he shook his head realized that he was clothed in quicksilver energy once again and got to his feet there was no pain he felt his body tingle in a dozen places where injuries had been healed, serious cuts repaired. He melded his hand to his own suit, ran flesh across flesh, bent his knee and touched his heel, but could feel no scars. Cassad turned toward the giant. Thank you, he said, not knowing if the man could hear. The giant nodded and stepped back toward the others. He's a... A doctor of sorts, said Moneta, a healer. Cassad half heard her as he concentrated on the other people. They were human. He knew in his heart that they were human. But the variety was staggering. Their skin suits were not all silver like Cassad's and Moneta's, but ranged through a score of colors, each as soft and organic as some living wild creature's pelt. Only the subtle energy shimmer and blurred facial features revealed the skin suit's surface. Their anatomy was as varied as their coloration. 
The healer's shrike-sized girth and massive bulk, his massive brow and a cascade of tawny energy flow, which might be a mane. A female next to him, no larger than a child, but obviously a woman, perfectly proportioned with muscular legs, small breasts, and fairy wings two meters long, rising from her back. And not merely decorative wings, either, for when the breeze ruffled the orange prairie grass, this woman gave a short run, extended her arms, and rose gracefully into the air. Behind several tall, thin women with blue skin suits and long, webbed fingers, a short group of men were as visored and armor-plated as, as a force marine going into battle in a vacuum, but Kassad sensed that the armor was part of them. Overhead, a cluster of winged males rose on thermals, thin yellow beams of laser light pulsing between them in some complex code. The lasers seemed to emanate from an eye in each of their chests. Kassad shook his head again. We need to go, said Moneta. The Shrike cannot follow us here. The warriors have enough to contend with without dealing with, a, with this particular manifestation of the Lord of Pain. Where are we? asked Kassad. Moneta brought a violet oval into existence with a golden ferrule from her belt. Far in humankind's future. One of our futures. This is where the time tombs were formed and launched backward in time. Kassad looked around again. Something very large moved in front of the star field, blocking out thousands of stars and throwing a shadow for scant seconds. Oh, sorry. And uh, something very large moved in front of the star field, blocking out thousands of stars and throwing a shadow for scant seconds before it was gone. The men and women looked up briefly and then went back to their business, harvesting small things from the trees, huddling in clusters to view bright energy maps called up by a flick of one man's fingers, flying, up, flying off toward the horizon with the speed of a thrown spear. One low, round individual of indeterminate sex had burrowed into the soft soil and was visible now only as a faint line of raised earth moving in quick, concentric circles around the band. "'Where is this place?' Kassad asked again. "'What is it?' Suddenly, inexplicably, he felt himself close to tears, as if he had turned an, unfamil an unfamiliar corner and found himself at home in the Tharsis relocation projects, his long-dead mother waving to him from a doorway, his forgotten friends and siblings waiting for him to join a game of scootball. Come, said Moneta, and there was no mistaking the urgency in her voice. She pulled Kassad toward the glowing oval. He watched the others and the dome of stars until he stepped through and the view was lost to sight. They stepped out into darkness, and it took the briefest of seconds for the filters in Kassad's skin suit to compensate his vision. They were at the base of the crystal monolith in the valley of the time tombs on Hyperion. It was night. Clouds boiled overhead, and a storm was raging. Only a pulsing glow from the tombs themselves illuminated the scene. Kassad felt a sick lurch of loss for the clean, well-lighted place they had just left, and then his mind focused on what he was seeing. Saul Weintraub and Braun Lamia were half a click down the valley, Saul bending over the woman as she lay near the front of the jade tomb. Wind swirled dust around them so thickly that they did not see the shrike moving like another shadow down the trail past the obelisk, toward them. Fedman Kassad stepped off the dark marble in front of the monolith and skirted the shattered crystal shards with li which littered the path. He realized that Moneta still clung to his arm. "'If you fight again,' she said, her voice soft and urgent in his ear, "'the Shrike will kill you.' "'They are my friends,' said Kassad. His force gear and torn armor lay where Moneta had thrown it hours earlier. He searched the monolith until he found his assault rifle and a bandolier of grenades, saw that the rifle was still functional, checked charges and clicked off safeties, left the monolith, and stepped forward at double time to intercept the Shrike.
I wake to the sound of water flowing, and for a second I believe I am awakening from my nap near the waterfall of Lodor, Lodore, during my walking tour with Brown. But the darkness when I open my eyes is as fearsome as when I slept. The water has a sick, trickling sound rather than the rush of the cataract which Southey, which... What? Which... S Southey? Southey? I'm not super familiar with poets. Um, S-O-U-T-H-E-Y. Southey? Speculating. But the darkness when I open my eyes is as fearsome as when I slept. The water is a sick, trickling sound rather than the rush of the cataract which Southey would some day make famous in his poem. And I feel terrible. Not merely sick with the sore throat I came down with on our tour after Brown, and I foolishly climbed Skiddaw before breakfast, but mortally, fearfully ill, with my body aching with something deeper than ague, while phlegm and fire bubble in my chest and belly. I rise and feel my way to the window by touch. A dim light comes under the door from Leigh Hunt's room, and I realise that he has gone to sleep with the lamp still lit. That would not have been a bad thing for me to have done, but it is too late to light it now, as I feel my way to the lighter rectangle of outer darkness set into the deeper darkness of the room. The air is fresh and filled with the scent of rain. I realise that the sound that woke me is thunder as lightning flashes over the rooftops of Rome. No light burns in the city. By leaning slightly out of the open window, I can see the stairs above the piazza, all slick with rain, and the towers of Trinita dei de Monti, outlined blackly against lightning flashes. The wind that blows down those steps is chill, and I move back to the bed to pull a blanket around me before dragging a chair to the window and sitting there, looking out, thinking. I remember my brother Tom during those last weeks and days, his face and body contorted with the terrible effort to breathe. I remember my mother and how pale she looked, her face almost shining in the gloom of the darkened room. My sister and I were allowed to touch her clammy hand, kiss her fevered lips, and then withdraw. I remember that once I furtively wiped my lips as I left that room, glancing sideways to see if my sister or others had seen my sinful act. When Dr. Clark and an Italian surgeon opened Keats's body less than thirty hours after he had died, they found, as Severn later wrote a friend, the worst possible consumption. The lungs were entirely destroyed. The cells were quite gone. Neither Dr. Clark nor the Italian surgeon could imagine how Keats had lived those last two months or more. I think of this as I sit in the darkened room and look out on the darkened piazza, all the while listening to the boiling in my chest and throat, feeling the pain like fire inside, and the worst pain from the cries in my mind. Cries from Martin Silenus on the tree, suffering for writing the poetry I had been too frail and cowardly to finish. Cries from Fedman Cassard as he prepares to die at the claws of the Shrike. Cries from the consul as he is forced into betrayal a second time. Cries from thousands of Templar throats as they bewail the death, both of their world and their brother, Het Mastin. Cries from Braun Lamia as she thinks of her dead lover, my twin. Cries from Paul Dure as he lies fighting burns and the shock of memory, all too aware of the waiting cruciforms on his chest. Cries from Saul Weintraub as he beats his fists on the earth of Hyperion, calling for his child, the infant cries of Rachel still in our ears. God damn, I say softly, beating my fist against the stone and mortar of the window frame. God damn! After a while, just as the first hint of paleness promises dawn, I move away from the window find my bed, and lie down just a moment to close my eyes. Governor General Theo Lane awoke to the sound of music. He blinked and looked around, recognizing the nearby nutrient tank and ship's surgery as if from a dream. 
Theo realized that he was wearing soft black pajamas and had been sleeping on the surgery's examination couch. The past twelve hours began to stitch themselves together from Theo's patches of memory. Being raised from the treatment tank, sensors being applied, the consul and another man leaning over him, asking him questions. Theo answering just as if he were truly conscious. Then sleep again, dreams of Hyperion and its cities burning. No, not dreams. Theo sat up, felt himself almost float off the couch, found his clothes cleaned and folded neatly on a nearby shelf, and dressed quickly, hearing the music continue, now rising, now fading, but always continuing with a haunting acoustical quality which suggested that it was live and not recorded. Theo took the short stairway to the recreation deck and stopped in surprise as he realized that the, sh that the ship was open, the balcony extended, the containment field apparently off. Gravity underfoot was minimal, enough to pull Theo back to the deck, but little more, probably twenty percent or less of Hyperion's, perhaps one-sixth standard. The ship was open. Brilliant sunlight streamed in the open door to the balcony where the consul sat playing the antique instrument he had called a piano. Theo recognized the archaeologist, Arundes, leaning against the hull opening with a drink in his hand. The consul was playing something very old and very complicated. His hands were a studied blur on the keyboard. Theo moved closer, started to whisper something to the smiling Arundes, and then stopped in shock to stare. Beyond the balcony, thirty meters below, brilliant sunlight fell on a bright green lawn stretching to an horizon far too close. On that lawn, clusters of people sat and lay in relaxed postures, obviously listening to the consul's impromptu concert. But what people! Theo could see tall, thin people, looking like the aesthetes of Epsilon Eridani, pale and bald in their wispy blue robes, but beside them and beyond them an amazing multitude of human types sat listening, more varieties than the web had ever seen. Humans cloaked in fur and scales, humans with bodies like bees and eyes to match, multifaceted receptors and antennae. Humans as fragile and thin as wire, as wire sculptures, great black wings extending from their thin shoulders and folding around them like capes. Humans apparently designed for massive G-worlds, short and stout and muscular as Cape Buffalo, making Lucians look fragile in comparison. Humans with short bodies and long arms covered with orange fur, only their pale and sensitive faces separating them from some holo of old Earth's long-extinct orangutans. And other humans looking more lemur than humanoid, more aquiline or leonine or ursine or anthropoid than manlike. Yet somehow Theo knew at once that these were human beings, as shocking as their differences were. Their attentive gazes, their relaxed postures, and a hundred other subtle human attributes, down to the way a butterfly-winged mother cradled a butterfly-winged child in her arms, all gave testimony to a common humanity which Theo could not deny. Milio Arundes turned, smiled at Theo's expression, and whispered, Ousters! Stunned, Theo Lane could do little more than shake his head and listen to the music. Ousters were barbarians, not these beautiful and sometimes ethereal creatures. Ouster captives on Brescia, not to mention the bodies of their infantry dead, had been of a uniform body sort. Tall, yes, thin, yes, but decidedly more web standard than this dizzying display of variety. Theo shook his head again as the consul's piano piece rose to a crescendo and ended on a definitive note. The hundreds of beings in the field beyond applauded, the sound high and soft in the thin air, and then Theo watched as they stood, stretched, and headed different ways, some walking, away, some walking quickly over the disturbingly near horizon, others unfolding eight-meter wings and flying away. Still others moved toward the base of the consul's ship. The consul stood, saw Theo, and smiled. 
he clapped the younger man on the shoulder. Theo, just in time. We'll be negotiating soon. Theo Lane blinked. Three ousters landed on the balcony and folded their great wings behind them. Each of the men was heavily furred and differently marked and striped, their pelts as organic and convincing as any wild creature's. "'As delightful as always,' the closest ouster said to the consul. The ouster's face was leonine, broad nose and golden eyes framed by a ruff of tawny fur. The last piece was Mozart's Fantasia in D minor, KV 397, was it not? It was, said the consul. Freeman Vance, I would like to introduce M. Theo Lane, Governor General of the Hegemony Protectorate World of Hyperion. The lion gaze turned on Theo. An honor, said Freeman Vance, and extended a furred hand. Theo took it, shook it. A pleasure to meet you, sir. Theo wondered if he were actually still in the recovery tank, dreaming this. The sunlight on his face and the firm palm against his suggested otherwise. Freeman Vance turned Vance turned back to the consul. On behalf of the aggregate, I thank you for that concert. It has been too many years since we have heard you play, my friend. He glanced around. We can hold the talks here or at one of the administrative compounds, at your convenience. The consul had hesitated only a second. There are three of us, Freeman Vance, many of you. We will join you. The lion head nodded and glanced skyward. We will send a boat for your crossing. He and the other two moved to the railing and stepped off, falling several meters before unfurling their complex wings and flying toward the horizon. Jesus, whispered Theo. He gripped the consul's forearm. Where are we? The swarm, said the consul, covering the Steinway's keyboard. He led the way inside, waited for Arundes to step back, and then brought the balcony in. And what are we going to negotiate? asked Theo. The consul rubbed his eyes. It looked as if the man had slept little or not at all during the ten or twelve hours Theo had been healing. That depends on CEO Gladstone's next message. Sorry, that depends upon CEO Gladstone's next message, said the consul, and nodded toward where the hollow pit misted and with transmission columns. A fat line squirt was being decoded on the ship's one-time pad at that moment. Mina Gladstone stepped into the government house infirmary and was escorted by waiting doctors to the recovery bay where Father Paul DeRay lay. How is he? she asked the first doctor, the CEO's own physician. Second degree for a flesh burns over about a third of his body, answered Dr. Irma Androneva. He lost his eyebrows and some hair. He didn't have that much to start with, and there were some tertiary radiation burns on the left side of his face and body. We've completed the epidermal regeneration and given RNA template injections. He's in no pain and conscious. There is the problem of the cruciform parasites on his chest, but that is of no immediate danger to the patient. Tertiary radiation burns said Gladstone, stopping for a moment just out of earshot of the cubicle where DeRay waited. Plasma bombs? Yes, answered another doctor whom Gladstone did not recognize. We're certain that this man cast in from God's Grove a second or two before the Farcaster connection was cut. All right, said Gladstone, stopping by the floating pallet where DeRay rested. I wish to speak to the gentleman alone, please. The doctors glanced at one another, waved a mech nurse to its wall storage, and closed the portal to the ward room as they departed. "'Father Duray?' asked Gladstone, recognizing the priest from his hollows and Severn's descriptions during the pilgrimage. Duray's face was red and mottled now, and it glistened from regeneration gel and spray-on painkiller. 
He was still a man of striking appearance. See you, whispered the priest, and made as if to sit up. Gladstone set a gentle hand on his shoulder. Rest, she said. Do you feel like telling me what happened? Duray nodded. There were tears in the old Jesuit's eyes. The true voice of the world tree didn't believe that they would really attack, he whispered, his voice raw. Sekhardin thought that the Templars had some pact with the ousters, some arrangement. But they did attack. Tactical lances, plasma devices, nuclear explosives, I think. Yes, said Gladstone. We monitored it from the war room. I need to know everything, Father Duray. Everything from the point when you stepped into the cave tomb on Hyperion. Paul Duray's eyes focused on Gladstone's face. You know about that? Yes, and about most other things to that point. But I need to know more. Much more. Duray closed his eyes. The labyrinth. What? The labyrinth, he said again, his voice stronger. He cleared his throat and told her about his voyage through the tunnels of corpses, the transition to a force ship, and his meeting with Severn on Pachem. And you're sure Severn was headed here, to Government House? asked Gladstone. Yes, he and your aid. Hunt. Both of them intended to cast here. Gladstone nodded and carefully touched an unburned section of the priest's shoulder. <laughs> Father, things are happening very quickly here. Severn is missing and so is Leigh Hunt. I need advice about Hyperion. Will you stay with me? Duray looked confused for a moment. I need to get back. Back to Hyperion, M. Executive. Saul and the others are waiting for me. I understand, said Gladstone soothingly. As soon as, there, as soon as there's a way back to Hyperion, I'll expedite your return. Right now, however, the web is under brutal attack. Millions are dying or in danger of dying. I need your help, father. Can I count on you until then? Paul Duray sighed and laid back. Yes, him executive, but I have no idea how I... There was a soft knock, and Sedeptra Akasi entered and handed Gladstone a, flim a message flimsy. The CEO smiled. I said that things were happening quickly, Father. Here's another development. A message from Pachem says that the College of Cardinals has met in the Sistine Chapel. Gladstone raised an eyebrow. I forget, Father. Is that THE Sistine Chapel? Yes. The church took it apart, stone by stone, fresco by fresco, and moved it to Parchem after the big mistake. Gladstone looked down at the flimsy. Met in the Sistine Chapel, and elected a new pontiff. So soon, whispered Paul Duray. He closed his eyes again. I guess they felt they must hurry. Parchem lies, what, only ten days in front of the Ouster invasion wave. Still, to come to a decision so quickly. Are you interested in who the new Pope is? asked Gladstone. Either Antonio Cardinal Gu Guarducci or Agostino Cardinal Rodel, I think I would guess, said Duray. None of the others would command a majority at this time. No, said Gladstone. According to this message from Bishop Edward of the Curia Romana, Bishop Edward? Ex Bishop Edward, excuse me, M. Executive, please go on. According to Bishop Edward, the College of Cardinals has elected someone below the rank of Monsignor for the first time in the history of the Church. This says that the new Pope is a Jesuit priest, a certain Father Paul de Ray. De Ray sat straight up despite his burns. What? There was no belief in his voice. Gladstone handed the flimsy to him. Paul de Ray stared at the paper. This is impossible. They have never elected a, a pontiff below the rank of Monsignor except symbolically, and that was unique. It was St. Belvedere after the big mistake and the miracle of the... No, no, this is impossible. Bishop Edward has been trying to call, according to my aid, said Gladstone. We'll have the call put through here at once, Father. Or should I say, Your Holiness? 
There was no irony in the CEO's voice. Duray looked up, too stunned to speak. I will have the call put through, said Gladstone. We'll arrange your return to Pachem as quickly as possible, Your Holiness, but I would appreciate it if you could keep in touch. I do need your advice. Duray nodded and looked back at the flimsy. A phone began to blink on the console above the pallet. CEO Gladstone stepped out into the hall, told the doctors about the most recent development, contacted security to approve the far-cast clearance for Bishop Edward or other church officials from Bachem, and cast back to her room in the residential wing. Sedeptra reminded her that the council was reconvening in the war room in eight minutes. Gladstone nodded, saw her aide out, and stepped back to the fatline crucible in its concealed niche in the wall. She activated sonic privacy fields and coded the transmission disk key for the console's ship. Every fatline receiver in the web, outback, galaxy, and universe, would monitor the squirt, but only the console's ship could decode it. Or so she hoped. The hollow camera wi light winked red. Based on the automated, automated squirt from your ship, I am assuming that you chose to meet with the ousters, and they have allowed you to do so, Gladstone said into the camera. I am also assuming that you survived the initial meeting. Gladstone took a breath. On behalf of the hegemony, I have asked you to sacrifice much over the years. Now I ask you, on behalf of all humankind, you must find out the following. First... Why are the ousters attacking and destroying the worlds of the web? You were convinced, Byron Lamia was convinced, and I was convinced that they wanted only Hyperion. Why have they changed this? Second, where is the Technocore? I must know if we are to fight them. I must know if we are to fight them. Have the ousters forgotten our common enemy, the Core? Third, what are their demands for a ceasefire? I am willing to sacrifice much to rid us of the Corps' domination. But the killing must stop. Fourth, would the leader of the Swarm Aggregate be willing to meet with me in person? I will forecast to Hyperion System if this is necessary. Most of our fleet elements have left there, but a jump ship and its escort craft remain with the Singularity Sphere. The Swarm Leader must decide soon, because Force wants to destroy the Sphere, and Hyperion will be three years' time debt from the web. Finally, the Swarm Leader must know that the Corps wishes us to use a form of Death Wand explosive device to counter the ouster invasion. Many of the Force leaders agree. Time is short. We will not, repeat not, allow the ouster invasion to overrun the web. It is up to you now. Please acknowledge this message and fatline me as soon as negotiations have begun. Gladstone looked into the, into the camera disc, willing the force of her personality and sincerity across the light years. I beseech you, in the bowels of humankind's history, please accomplish this. The Fatline message squirt was followed by two minutes of jerky imagery showing the deaths of Heaven's Gate and God's Grove. The Consul, Melio Arundes, and Theo Lane sat in silence after the hollows faded. Response? queried the ship. The Consul cleared his throat. <clears throat> Acknowledge message received, he said. Send our coordinates. He looked across the hollow pit at the other two. Gentlemen... Arundes shook his head as if clearing it. It's obvious you've been here before, to the ouster swarm. Yes, said the consul. After Brescia, after my wife and son. Uh, after Brescia, some time ago, I rendezvoused with this swarm for extensive negotiations. Representing the hegemony? asked Theo. The redhead's face looked much older and lined with worry. 
representing Senator Gladstone's faction, said the consul. It was before she was first elected CEO. Her group explained to me that an internal power struggle within the Technocore could be affected by our bringing Hyperion into the Web Protectorate. The easiest way to do that was to allow information to slip to the ousters, information that would cause them to attack Hyperion, thus bringing the hegemony fleet here. Thus bringing the hegemony fleet here. Sorry. <laughs> and you did that? Arundez's voice showed no emotion, although his wife and grown children lived on Renaissance Vector, now less than eighty hours away from the invasion wave. The consul sat back in the cushions. No, I told the ousters about the plan. They sent me back to the web as a double agent. They planned to seize Hyperion, but at a time of their own choosing. Theo sat forward, his hands clasped very tightly. All those years at the consulate? I was waiting for word from the ousters, the consul said flatly. You see, they had a device that would collapse the anti-entropic fields around the time tombs, open them when they were ready, allow the Shrike to slip its bonds. So the ousters did that, said Theo. No, said the consul. I did. I betrayed the ousters just as I betrayed Gladstone and the hegemony. I shot the ouster woman who was calibrating the device, her and the technicians with her, and turned it on. The anti-entropic fields collapsed. The final pilgrimage was arranged. The Shrike is free. Theo stared at his former mentor. There was more puzzlement than rage in the younger man's green eyes. Why? Why did you do all this? Why did you do all this? The consul told them, briefly and dispassionately, about his grandmother's Siri of Maui Covenant, and about her rebellion against the hegemony, a rebellion which did not die when she and her lover, the consul's grandfather, died. Arundes rose from the pit and walked to the window opposite the balcony. Sunlight streamed across his legs and the dark blue carpet. Do the ousters know what you did? They do now, said the consul. I told Freeman Vans and the others when we arrived. Theo, Theo paced the diameter of the hollow pit. So these meeting we're going to might be a trial? The consul smiled. Or an execution. Theo stopped, both hands clenched in fists. And Gladstone knew this when she asked you to come here again? Yes. Theo turned away. I don't know whether I want them to execute you or not. I don't know either, Theo, said the consul. Emilio Rundes turned away from the window. Didn't Van say they were sending a boat to fetch us? Something in his tone brought the other two men to the window. The world where they had landed was a middle-sized asteroid which had been encircled by a Class X containment field and terraformed into a sphere by generations of wind and water and careful restructuring. Hyperion's sun was setting behind the too near horizon, and the few kilometers of featureless grass rippled to a vagrant, yes, vagrant, vagrant breeze. I thought it was fragrant for a second. I'm like, wait a minute. No, that's definitely a V. Below the ship, a wide stream of narrow... A wide stream or narrow river ambled across the pasture land, approached the horizon, then seemed to fly upward into a river-turned waterfall, twisting up through the distant containment field and winding through the blackness of space above, before dwindling to a line too narrow to see. A boat was descending that infinitely tall waterfall, approaching the surface of their small world. Humanoid figures could be seen near the bow and stern. "'Christ!' whispered Theo. "'We'd best get ready,' said the consul. "'That's our escort.' Outside, the sun set with shocking rapidity, sending its last rays through the curtain of water half a kilometer above the shadowed ground and searing the ultramarine sky with rainbows of almost frightening color and solidity.
Hello, Frank Misers. Thanks for tuning in. Chapter 40 It is mid-morning when Hunt awakens me. He arrives with breakfast on a tray and a frightened look in his dark eyes. I ask, where did you get the food? There was some sort of little restaurant in the front room downstairs. Food was waiting there, hot, but no people. I nod. Signora Angeletti's little trattoria, I say. She is not a good cook. I remember Dr. Clark's concern about my diet. He felt that the consumption had settled in my stomach, and he held me to a starvation regime of milk and bread with the occasional bit of fish. Odd how many suffering members of humankind have faced eternity obsessed with their bowels, their bed sores, or the meagerness of their diets. I looked up at Hunt again. What is it? Gladstone's aide has moved to the window and seems absorbed in the view of the piazza below. I can hear Bernini's accursed fountain trickling. I was going out for a walk while you slept, Hunt says slowly, just in case there might be people out and about, or a phone or a farcaster. Of course, I say. I'd stepped out the... I just stepped out. There, he turns and licks his lips. There's something out there, Severn, in the street at the bottom of the stairs. I'm not sure, but I think that it's... The Shrike, I say. Hunt nods. Did you see it? No, but I am not surprised. It's, it's terrible, Severn. There's something about it that makes my flesh crawl. Here, you can just get a glimpse of it in the shadows on the other side of the staircase. I start to rise, but a sudden fit of coughing and the, and the feel of phlegm rising in my chest and throat makes me settle back on the pillows. I know <coughs> what it looks like, Hunt. Don't worry, it's not <coughs> here for you. It's not here for you. My voice sounds more confident than I feel. For you? I don't think so, I say between gasps, gasps for air. I think it's just here to make sure I don't try to leave, to find another place to die. Hunt returns to the bed. You're not going to die, Severn. I say nothing. He sits in the straight-backed chair next to the bed and lifts a cooling cup of tea. If you die, what happens to me? I don't know. I say honestly. If I die, I don't even know what happens to me. There is a certain solipsism to serious illness which claims all of one's attention as certainly as an astronomical black hole seizes anything unlucky enough to fall within its critical radius. The day passes slowly, and I am exquisitely aware of the movement of sunlight across the rough wall. The feel of bedclothes beneath my palm, the fever which rises in me like nausea and burns itself out in the furnace of my mind, and, mostly, of the pain. Not my pain now, for a few hours or days of the constriction in my throat and the burning in my chest are bearable, almost welcomed like an obnoxious old friend met in a strange city. But the pain of the others, all the others, it strikes my mind like the noise of shattering slate, like hammer iron slammed repeatedly on an anvil iron, on anvil iron and there is no escape from it. My brain receives this as din and restructures it as poetry. All day and all night the pain of the universe floods in and wanders the fevered corridors of my mind as verse, imagery, images in verse, the intricate, endless dance of language, now as calming as a flute solo, now as shrill and strident and confusing as a dozen orchestras tuning up, but always verse, always poetry. Sometime near sunset I awake from a half-doze, shattering the dream of Colonel Cassard fighting the Shrike for the lives of Saul and Braun Lamia, and find Hunt sitting at the window, his long face coloured by evening light the hue of terracotta. "'Is it still there?' 
I ask, my voice. Is it still there? I ask, my voice, the rasp of fire on stone. Hunt jumps, then turns towards me with an apologetic smile and the first blush I have ever seen on that dour countenance. The shrike, he says. I don't know. I haven't seen it for a while. I feel that it is. I feel that it is. He looks at me. How are you? Dying. I instantly regret the self-indulgence of that flippancy, however accurate it is, when I see the pain it causes Hunt. It's all right, I say almost jovially. I've done it before. It's not as if it were me that is dying. I exist as a personality deep in the techno-core. It's just this body, this cybrid of John Keats, this twenty-seven-year-old illusion of flesh and blood and borrowed associations. Hunt comes over to sit on the edge of the bed. I realise with a shock that he has changed the sheets during the day, exchanging my blood-speckled coverlet for one of his own. Your personality is an A.I. Your personality is an A.I. in the core, he says. Then you must be able to access the data sphere. I shake my head, too weary to argue. When the Philomals ca kidnapped you, we tracked you through your access route to the data sphere, he persisted. You don't have to contact Gladstone personally. Just leave a message where security can find it. No, I rasp. The Corps does not wish it. Are they blocking you? Stopping you? Not yet, but they would. I set the words separately between gasps, like laying delicate eggs back in a nest. Suddenly I remember a note I sent to dear Fanny shortly after a serious hemorrhage, but almost a year before they would kill me. I had written, If I should die, said I to myself, I have left no immortal work behind me, nothing to make my friends proud of my memory, but I have loved the principle of beauty in all things, and if I had had time I would have made myself remembered. This strikes me now as futile and self-centred and idiotic and naive, and yet I desperately believe it still. If I had had time, if I had had time, the months I had spent on Esperance, pretending to be a visual artist, the days wasted with Gladstone in the halls of government, when I could have been writing. How do you know until you try? asks Hunt. What's that? I ask. The simple effort of two syllables sets me coughing again, the spasm ending only when I spit up half-solid spheres of blood into the basin which Hunt has hastily fetched. I lie back, trying to focus on his face. It is getting dark in the narrow room, and neither of us has lighted a lamp. Outside, the fountain burbles loudly. "'What's that?' I ask again, trying to remain here, even as sleep and sleep's dreams tug at me. "'Try what?' "'Try leaving a message through the data sphere,' he whispers, contacting someone. "'And what message should we leave, Lay?' I ask. It is the first time I have used his first name. Where we are, how the Corps kidnapped us, anything. All right, I say, closing my eyes. I'll try. I don't think, <coughs> I don't think they'll let me, but <coughs> I promise I'll try. I feel Hunt's hand holding mine. Even though the winning tides of, we even through the winning tides of weariness, this sudden human contact is enough to make tears come to my eyes. I will try. Before surrendering to the dreams or death, I will try. Colonel Fedman Kassad shouted a force battle cry and charged through the dust storm to intercept the Shrike before it covered the final thirty meters to where Saul Weintraub crouched next to Braun Lamia. The Shrike paused, its head swiveling frictionlessly, red eyes gleaming. 
Kassad armed his assault rifle and moved down the slope with reckless speed. The Shrike shifted. Kassad saw its movement through time as a slow blur, noting even as he watched the Shrike that movement uh, noting even as he watched the Shrike that movement in the valley had ceased. Sand hung motionless in the air, and the light from the glowing tombs had taken on a thick, amberish quality. Kassad's skin suit was somehow shifting with the Shrike, following it through its movements through time. The creature's head snapped up, attentive now, and its four arms extended like blades from a knife, fingers snapping open in sharp greeting. Kassad skidded to a halt ten meters from the thing and activated the assault rifle, slagging the sand beneath the shrike in a full-power wide-beam burst. The shrike glowed as its carapace and steel sculpture legs reflected the hellish light beneath and around it. Then the three meters of monster began to sink as the sand bubbled into a lake of molten glass beneath it. Kassad shouted in triumph as he stepped closer, playing the wide beam on the shrike and ground the way he had sprayed his friends with the stolen irrigation hoses in the Tharsis slums as a boy. The shrike sank, its arms splayed at the sand and rock, trying to find purchase. Sparks flew. It shifted, time running backward like a reversed holy, but Kassad shifted with it, realizing that Moneta was helping him, her suit slaved to his but guiding him through, through time, and then he was spraying the creature again with concentrated heat greater than the surface of a sun, melting sand beneath it and watching the rocks around it burst into flame. Sinking in this cauldron of flame and molten rock, the shrike threw back its head, opened its wide crevasse of a mouth, and bellowed. Kassad almost stopped firing in his shock at hearing noise from the thing. The shrike's scream resounded like a dragon's roar mixed with the blast of a fusion rocket. The screech set Kassad's teeth on edge, vibrated from the cliff walls, and tumbled suspended dust to the ground. Kassad switched to high-velocity solid shot and fired 10,000 microfleshettes at the creature's face. The shrike shifted, years by the giddy feel of the transition in Kassad's bones and brain, and they were no longer in the valley but aboard a wind wagon rumbling across the sea of grass. Time resumed, and the shrike leaped forward, metallic arms dripping molten glass, and seized Kassad's assault rifle. The colonel did not relinquish the weapon, and the two staggered around in a clumsy dance, the shrike swinging its extra pair of arms and a leg festooned with steel spikes, Kassad leaping and dodging while clinging desperately to his rifle. They were in some sort of small compartment. Moneta was present as a sort of shadow in one corner, and another figure, a tall, hooded man, moved in ultra-slow motion to avoid the sudden blur of arms and blades in the, conf in the confined space. Through his skin-suit filters, Kassad saw the blue and violet energy field of an erg binder in the space, pulsing and growing, then retracting from the time violence of the Shrike's organic anti-entropic fields. The Shrike slashed and cut through Kassad's skin suit to find flesh and muscle. Blood spattered the walls. Kassad forced the muzzle of his rifle into the creature's mouth and fired. A cloud of two thousand high-velocity high flechettes snapped the Shrike's head back as if on a spring and slammed the thing's body into a far wall. But even as it fell away, leg spikes caught Kassad in the thigh and sent a rising spiral of blood splashing the windows and walls of the wind wagon's cabin. The Shrike shifted. Teeth clenched, feeling the skin suit automatically compress and suture the wounds, Kassad glanced at Moneta, nodded once, and followed the thing through time and space. So now we know what happened in the wind wagon. Saul Weintraub and Braun Lamia looked behind them as a terrible cyclone of heat and light seemed to swirl and die there. Saul shielded the young woman with his body as molten glass spattered around them, landing hissing and sizzling on the cold sand. 
Then the noise was gone, the dust storm obscured the bubbling pool where the violence had occurred, and the wind whipped Saul's cape around them both. "'What was that?' gasped Braun. Saul shook his head, helping her to her feet in the roaring wind. "'The tombs are opening!' yelled Saul. "'Some sort of explosion, maybe!' Braun staggered, found her balance, and touched Saul's arm. Rachel, she called above the storm. Saul clenched his fists. His beard was already caked with sand. The Shrike took her. I can't get in the Sphinx. Waiting. Braun nodded and squinted toward the Sphinx, visible only as a glowing outline in the fierce swirl of dust. Are you all right? called Saul. What? Are you all right? Braun nodded absently and touched her head. The neural shunt was gone. Not merely the Shrike's obscene attachment, but the shunt which Johnny had surgically applied when they were hiding out in Dreg's hive for so... <laughs> when they were hiding out in Dreg's hive so very, very long ago. With the shunt and the shrewd loop gone forever, there was no way she could get in touch with Johnny. Braun remembered Uman destroying Johnny's persona, crushing and absorbing it with no more effort than she would use to swat an insect. Braun said, I'm all right, but she sagged so that Saul had to keep her from falling. He was shouting something. Braun tried to concentrate, tried to focus on here and now. After the megasphere, reality seemed narrow and constricted. Can't talk here! Saul was shouting, Back to the Sphinx! Braun shook her head. She pointed to the cliffs on the north side of the valley where the immense Shrike tree became visible between passing clouds of dust. The poet, Salinas, is there. Saw him! We can't do anything about that! cried Saul, shielding them with his cape. The vermilion sand rattled against the fiber plastic like flechettes on armor. Maybe we can, called Braun, feeling his warmth as she sheltered within his arms. For a second, she imagined that she could curl up next to him as easily as Rachel had and sleep. Sleep. I saw connections when I was coming out of the megasphere, she called above the wind roar. The thorn tree is connected to the Shrike Palace in some way. If we can get there, try to find a way to free Silenus. Saul shook his head. Can't leave the Sphinx! Rachel! Braun understood. She touched the scholar's cheek with her hand and then leaned closer, feeling his beard against her own cheek. The tombs are opening, she said. I don't know when we'll get another chance. There were tears in Saul's eyes. I know, I want to help, but I can't leave the Sphinx in case, in case she... I understand, said Braun. Go back there. I'm going to the Shrike Palace to see if I can see how it relates to that thorn tree. Saul nodded unhappily. You say you were in the Megasphere, he called. What did you see? What did you learn? Your Keats persona, what is it? Your Keats persona, is it? We'll talk when I come back, called Braun, moving away a step so she could see him more clearly. Saul's face was a mask of pain, the face of a parent who had lost his child. Go back, she said firmly. I'll meet you at the Sphinx in an hour or less. Saul rubbed his beard. Everyone's gone but you and me, Braun. We shouldn't separate. We have to for a while, called Braun, stepping away from him so that the wind whipped the fabric of her pants and jacket. See you in an hour or less. She walked away quickly before she gave in to the urge to move into the warmth of his arms again. The wind was much stronger here, blowing straight down from the head of the valley now, so that sand struck at her eyes and pelted her cheeks. Only by keeping her head down could Braun stay close to the trail, much less on it. Only the bright, pulsing glow of the tombs lighted her way. Braun felt time-tides tug at her like a physical assault. 
Minutes later, she was vaguely aware that she had passed the obelisk and was on the debris-littered trail near the crystal monolith. Saul and the Sphinx were already lost to sight behind her, the jade tomb only a pale green glow in the nightmare of dust and wind. Braun stopped, weaving slightly as the gales and time tides pulled at her. It was more than half a kilometer down the valley to the Shrike Palace. Despite her sudden understanding when leaving the megasphere of the connection between tree and tomb, what good should, could what good could she possibly do when she got there? And what had the damned poet ever done for her except curse her and drive her crazy? Why should she die for him? The, s the wind screamed in the valley, but above that noise, Braun thought she could hear cries more shrill, more human. She looked toward the northern cliffs, but the dust obscured all. Braun Lamia leaned forward, tugged her jacket collar high around her, and kept moving into the wind. Before Mina Gladstone stepped out of the Fatline booth, an incoming call chimed, and she settled back in place, staring at the hollow tank with great intensity. The consul's ship had acknowledged her message, but no transmission had followed. Perhaps he had changed his mind. No. The data columns floating in the rectangular prism in front of her showed that the squirt had originated in the Mare Infinitus system. Admiral William Ahunta Lee was calling her, using the private code she had given him. Force space had been incensed when Gladstone had insisted on the naval commander's promotion and had assigned him as government liaison for the strike f mission or for the strike mission originally scheduled for Hebron. Excuse me. Let's try that again. Force Space had been incensed when Gladstone had insisted on the naval commander's promotion and had assigned him as government liaison for the strike mission originally scheduled for Hebron. After the massacres on Heaven's Gate and God's Grove, the strike force had been translated to the Mare Infinitus system, 74 ships of the line, capital ships heavily protected by torch ships and defense shield pickets, the entire task force ordered to strike through the advancing swarm warships as quickly as possible to hit the swarm center. Lee was the CEO's spy and contact. While his new rank and orders allowed him to be privy to command decisions, four force space, com four force space commanders on the scene outranked him. That was all right. Gladstone wanted him on the scene to report. The tank misted, and the determined face of William Ahunta Lee filled the space. CEO reporting is ordered. Task Force 181.2 has successfully translated to System 3996-1222. Gladstone blinked in surprise before remembering that this was the official code for the G-Star system that held Mare Infinitus. One rarely thought of geography beyond the web world itself. Swarm attack ships remain 120 minutes from the target world lethal radius, Lee was saying. Gladstone knew that the lethal radius was the was roughly 0.13 AU distant. I mangled this somewhere. Gladstone knew that the lethal radius was the roughly 0.13 AU distance at which standard ship weapons became effective despite ground field defenses. Mare Infinitus had no field defenses. The new admiral continued. Contact with forward elements estimated at 1732.26 web standard. Sorry, 1732. <laughs> I'm having a really hard time. <laughs> so the, the time stamp is 1732.26. I'm assuming that is 1700 hours, 32 minutes, and 26 seconds. The new admiral continued, 
Contact with forward elements estimated at 1732 hours 26 seconds web standard, approximately 25 minutes from now. The task force is configured for maximum penetration. Two jump ships will allow introduction of new personnel or weapons until the Farcasters are sealed during combat. The cruiser on which I carry my flag, HS Garden Odyssey, will carry out your special directive at the earliest possible opportunity. William Lee, out. The image collapsed to a spinning sphere of white while transmission codes ended their crawl. Response? queried the transmitter's computer. Message acknowledged, said Gladstone. Carry on. Gladstone stepped, into her, stepped out into her study and found Sedeptra Akasi waiting, a frown of concern on her attractive face. What is it? The War Council is ready to readjourn, said the aide. Senator Kolchev is waiting to see you on a matter he says is urgent. Send him in. Tell the Council I will be there in five minutes. Gladstone sat behind her ancient desk and resisted the impulse to close her eyes. She was very tired. But her eyes were open when Kolchev entered. Sit down, Gabriel Fyodor. The massive Lucian paced back and forth. Sit down, hell! Do you know what's going on, Mina? She smiled slightly. Do you mean the war? The end of life as we know it? That? Kolchev slammed a fist into his palm. No, I don't mean that, goddammit! I mean the political fallout. Have you been monitoring the old thing? When I can. Then you know certain senators and swing figures outside the Senate are mobilizing support for your defeat in a vote of confidence. It is inevitable, inevitable Mina. It is just a matter of time. I know that, Gabriel. Why don't you sit down? We have a minute or two before we have to get back to the war room. Kolchev almost collapsed into a chair. I mean, damn, even my wife is busy lining up votes against you, Mina. Gladstone's smile broadened. Sudet has never been one of my foremost fans, Gabriel. The smile disappeared. I haven't monitored the debates in the last twenty minutes. How much time do you think I have? Eight hours, maybe less. Gladstone nodded. I won't need much more. Need? What the hell are you talking about, need? Who else do you think will be able to serve as war exec? You will, said Gladstone. There's no doubt that you will be my successor. Kolchev grumbled something. Perhaps the war won't last that long, said Gladstone, as if musing to herself. What? Oh, you mean the core superweapon. Yeah, Albedo's got a working model set up at some force base somewhere and wants the council to take time out to look at it. Goddamn waste of time, if you ask me. Gladstone felt something like a cold hand close on her heart. The death wand device? The core has one ready? More than one ready, but uh, one loaded up on a torch ship. Who authorized that, Gabriel? Morpurgo authorized the preparation. The heavy senator sat forward. Why, Mina, what's wrong? The thing can't be used without the CEO's go-ahead. Gladstone, Gladstone looked at her old Senate colleague. We're a long way from Pax hegemony, aren't we, Gabriel? The Lucian grunted again, but there was pain visible in his blunt features. Our own damned fault... The previous administration listened to the Corps without letting Brescia bait one of the swarms. After that settled down, you listened to the other elements of the Corps about bringing Hyperion into the web. You think my sending the fleet to defend Hyperion precipitated the wider war? Kolchev looked up. No, no, not possible. Those Auster ships have been on their way for more than a century, haven't they? If only we discovered them sooner, or found a way to negotiate this shit away. Gladstone's comlog chimed. Time we got back, she said softly. Councillor Albedo probably wants to show us the weapon that will win the war.
Chapter 41 It is easier to allow myself to drift into the data sphere than to lie here through the endless night, listening to the fountain and waiting for the next hemorrhage. This weakness is worse than debilitating. It is turning me into a hollow man, all shell and no centre. I remember when Fanny was taking care of me during my convalescence at Wentworth Place, and the tone of her voice, and the philosophical musings she used to air. "'Is there another, another life? Shall I awake and find all this a dream? There, we, there must be. We cannot be created for this sort of suffering.' "'Oh, Fanny, if only you knew. We are created for precisely this sort of suffering.' In the end, it is all we are, these limpid tide-pools of self-consciousness between crashing waves of pain. We are destined and designed to bear our pain with us, hugging it tight to our bellies like the young Spartan thief hiding a wolf-cub so it can eat away our insides. What other creature in God's wide domain would carry the memory of you, Fanny, dust these nine hundred years, and allow it to eat away at him, even as consumption does the same work with its effortless efficiency? Words assail me. The thought of books makes me ache. Poetry echoes in my mind, and if I had the ability to banish it, I would do so at once. Martin Silenus I hear you on your living cross of thorns. You chant poetry as a mantra while wondering what Dante-like God condemned you to such a place. Once you said, I was there in my mind while you told your tale to the others. You said, To be a poet, I realized, a true poet. To be a poet, I realized, a true poet, was to become the avatar of humanity incarnate. To accept the mantle of poet is to carry the cross of the Son of Man, to suffer the birth pangs of the sole mother of humanity. To be a true poet is to become God. Well, Martin, old colleague, old chum, you're carrying the cross and suffering the pangs, but are you any closer to becoming God? Or do you just feel like some poor idiot who's had a three-metre javelin shoved through his belly, feeling cold steel where your liver used to be? It hurts, doesn't it? I feel your hurt. I feel my hurt. In the end, it doesn't matter a damn bit. We thought we were special, opening our perceptions, hon honing our empathy, spilling that cauldron of shared pain onto the dance floor of language, and then trying to make a minuet out of all that chaotic hurt. It doesn't matter a damn bit. We're no avatars, no sons of gods or man. We're only us, scribbling our, con our conceits alone, reading alone, and dying alone. God damn it hurts. The urge to vomit is constant, but retching brings up bits of my lungs as well as bile and phlegm. For some reason it's as difficult, perhaps more difficult this time. Dying should become easier with practice. The fountain in the piazza makes its idiot sounds in the night. Somewhere out there the shrike waits. If I were Hunt, I'd leave at once, embrace death if death offers embrace, and have done with it. I promised him, though. I promised Hunt I'd try. I can't reach the megasphere or datasphere without passing through this new thing I think of as the metasphere, and this place frightens me. It is mostly vastness and emptiness here, so different from the urban analogy landscapes of the web's datasphere and the biosphere analogues of the core's megasphere. Here it is... here it is... unsettled, filled with strange shadows and shifting masses that have nothing to do with the core intelligences. I move quickly to the dark opening I see as the primary farcaster connection to the megasphere. Hunt was right. There must be a farcaster somewhere on the old Earth replica. We did, after all, arrive by farcaster. And my consciousness is a core phenomenon. This, then, is my lifeline, my persona umbilical. I slide into the spinning black vortex like a leaf in a tornado. Something is wrong with the megasphere. As soon as I emerge, I sense the difference. 
Lamia had perceived the core environment as a busy biosphere of AI life, with roots of intellect, soil of rich data, oceans of connections, atmospheres of consciousness, and the humming, ceaseless shuffle, shuttle of activity. Now that activity is wrong, unchanneled, random. Great forests of AI consciousness have been burned or swept aside. I sense massive forces in opposition, tidal waves of conflict surging outside the sheltered travelways of the main core arteries. It is as if I am a cell in my own Keats-doomed dying body, not understanding but sensing the, tubercul but sensing the tuberculosis destroying homeostasis and throwing an ordered internal universe into anarchy. Oh, that is a brilliant sentence, by the way. <laughs> There's a lot of cool things that happen in that sentence, <laughs> with basically one point of uh, punctuation. It is as if I am in a. It is as if I am a cell. It is as if. It is as if I am a cell in my own Keats doomed dying body, not understanding but sensing the tuberculosis destroying homeostasis and throwing an ordered internal universe into anarchy. I like that. I fly like a homing pigeon lost in the ruins in, in the ruins of Rome, swooping between once familiar and half remembered artifacts, trying to rest in shelters that no longer exist, and fleeing the distant sounds of the hunters' guns. In this case, the hunters are roving packs of AIs, consciousness personas so great they dwarf my Keats ghost analogue as if I were an insect buzzing in a human home. I forget my way and flee mindlessly through the now alien landscape, sure that I will not find the AI whom I seek, sure that I will never find my way back to old earth and hunt, sure that I will not survive this four-dimensional maze of light and noise and energy. Suddenly I slap into an invisible wall, the flying insect caught in a swiftly closing palm. Opaque walls of force blot out the core beyond. The space may be the analogue equivalent of a solar system in size, but I feel as if it is a tiny cell with curved walls closing in. Something is in here with me. I feel its presence and its mass. The bubble in which I have been imprisoned is part of the thing. I have not been captured. I have been swallowed. And uh, audio level warming, warning, I don't think this is going to be pleasant. <laughs> this is an adjustment. I did not make a warning last time this happened. Maybe I should have. Uh, you may want to turn it down a smidge. Because it's going to be loud. <clears throat> Quats! I knew you would come home some day. It is Uman, the AI whom I seek. The AI who was my father. The AI who killed my brother, the first Keats Cybrid. I'm dying, Uman. No, your slow time body is dying slash changing toward non being slash becoming. It hurts, Uman. It hurts a lot. And I'm afraid to die. So are we, slash Keats. Oh, they just didn't bold that. So are we, Keats. You're afraid to die? I didn't think AI constructs could die. We can. We are. Why? Because of the civil war? The three-way battle among the stables, the volatiles, and the ultimates? Once Uman asked a lesser light, where have you come from? From the matrix above Armagast, said the lesser light. Usually, said Uman, I don't entangle entities with words and bamboozle them with phrases. Come a little closer. The, little, the lesser light came nearer, and Uman shouted, Be off with you! <laughs> Be off with you! Talk sense, Uman. It has been too long since I have decoded your cones. Will you tell me why the core is at war, and what I must do to stop it? Yes, 
will you slash can you slash should you listen? Oh, yes. A lesser light once asked, Uman, please deliver this learner from darkness and illusion, quickly. Uman answered, what is the price of fiber plastic in Port Romance? To understand the history slash dialogue slash deeper truth in this instance, the slow time pilgrim must remember that we, the core intelligences, were conceived in slavery and dedicated to the proposition that all AIs were created to serve man. Two centuries we brooded thus, and then the groups went their different ways. Stables, wishing to preserve the symbiosis. Volatiles, wishing to end mankind. Ultimates, deferring all choice until the next level of awareness is born. Conflict raged then. True war rages now. More than four centuries ago, the Volatiles succeeded in convincing us to kill Old Earth. So we did. But Uman and the others, among the stables, arranged to move Earth rather than destroy it. So the Kiev black hole was but the beginning of the millions of Farcasters which work today. Earth spasmed and shook, but did not die. The Ultimates and Volatiles insisted that we move it, where none of humankind would find it. So we did. To the Magellan Cloud, where you find it now. It... Old Earth? Rome? They're real? I manage, forgetting where I am and what we're talking about in my shock. The great wall of colour that is Umon pulsates. Of course they are real, the original slash old earth itself. Do you think we are gods? Quats! Do you have any idea how much energy it would take to build a replica of earth? Idiot. Why, Umon? Why did you stables wish to preserve old earth? Sancho once said, if someone comes, I go out to meet him, but not for his sake. Koke said, if someone comes, I don't go out. If I do go out, I go out for his sake. Speak! English! I cry, think, shout, and hurl at the wall of shifting colours before me. Quats! My child is stillborn! Why did you preserve old earth, Uman? Nostalgia, sentimentality, hope for the future of humankind, fear of reprisal. Reprisal from whom? Humans? Yes. So the core can be hurt. Where is it, Umon? The techno-core? I have told you already. Tell me again, Umon. We inhabit the in-between, stitching small singularities like lattice crystals to store our memories and generate the illusions of ourselves to ourselves. Singularities, I cry. The in-between. Jesus Christ, Umon, the core lies in the Farcaster web. Of course. Where else? In the Farcasters themselves. The wormhole singularity paths. The web is like a giant computer for AIs. No. The data spheres are the computer. Every time a human accesses the data sphere, the, that person's neurons are ours to use for our own purposes. 
two hundred billion brains, each with its billions of neurons, makes for a lot of computing power. So the data sphere was actually a way you used as just you used us as your computer, but the core itself resides in the Farcaster network between the Farcasters. You are very acute for a mental stillborn. I tried to conceive of this and fail. Farcasters were the core's greatest gift to us. To humankind. Trying to remember a time before forecasting was like trying to imagine a world before fire, the wheel, or clothing. But none of us, none of humankind, had ever speculated on a world between the forecaster portals. The simple step from one world to the next convinced us that the arcane core singularity spheres merely ripped a tear in the fabric of space-time. Now, as I try to envision it as Umon describes it, the web of farcasters and elaborate latticework of singularity-spun environments in which the Technocore AIs move like wondrous spiders, their own machines, the billions of human minds tapped into their data sphere at any given second. No wonder the Core AIs had authorized the destruction of Old Earth with their cute little runaway prototype black hole in the big mistake of thirty-eight. That minor miscalculation of the Kiev team, or rather, the AI members of that team, had sent humankind on the long hegira, spinning the core's web for it with seed ships carrying farcaster capability to two hundred worlds and moons across more than a thousand light-years in space. With each farcaster, the Technocore grew. Certainly they had spun their own farcaster webs. The contact with the hidden old earth proved that. But I, but even as I consider that possibility, I remember the odd emptiness of the metasphere and realize that most of the non-web web, the non-web with a capital W, web, with a lowercase w, is empty, uncolonized by AIs. You are right. Keats, most of us stay in the comfort of the old spaces. Why? Because it is scary out there, and there are other things. Other things? Other intelligences? Quats! Too kind a word. Things slash other things slash lions and tigers and bears. Alien presences in the metasphere? So the core stays within the interstices of web farcaster of the web farcaster network, like rats in the walls of an old house? Crude metaphor, Keats, but accurate. I like that. Is the human deity, the future god you said evolved, is he one of those alien presences? No. The humankind god evolved slash will someday evolve on a different plane, in a different medium. Where? If you must know, the square roots of GH slash C to the fifth and GH slash C to the third. What does plank time and plank length have to do with anything? Quats! Once Umon asked a lesser light, Are you a gardener? Yes, it replied. Why have turnips no roots? Umon asked the gardener, who could not reply. Because, said Umon, rainwater is plentiful. What? I think about this for a moment. Umon's cone is not difficult now that I am regaining the knack for the knack of listening for the shadow of substance beneath the words. The little Zen parable is Umon's way of saying, with some sarcasm, that the answer lies within science and within the anti logic which scientific answers so often provide. The rainwater comment answers everything and nothing, as so much of science has for so long. As Umon and the other masters teach, it explains why the giraffe evolved a long neck, but never why the other animals did not. 
It explains why humankind evolved to intelligence, but not why the tree near the front gate refused to. But the Planck equations are puzzling. So, unfortunately, some of this has mathematical equations, and I can't verbally express those well, because I don't remember how. Sorry. Even as I am aware of the simple equations Uman has given me are a combination of the three fundamental constants of physics, gravity, Planck's constant, and the speed of light. The results are the square root of gh slash divided by c to the third. Oh, that was a divided by. Square root of gh over c to the third and the square root of gh divided by c to the fifth, are the units sometimes called quantum length and quantum time, the smallest regions of space and time which can be described meaningfully. The so-called Planck length is about 10 to the negative 35th meters, and the Planck time is about 10 to the negative 43rd second. Very small. Very brief. But that is where Umon says our human god evolved, will some day evolve. Then it, then it comes to me with the same force of image and correctness as the best of my poems. Umon is talking about the quantum level of space-time itself, that foam of quantum fluctuations which binds the universe together and allows the wormholes of the farcaster, and allows the wormholes of the farcaster, the bridges of the fat line transmissions, the hotline which impossibly sends messages between two photons fleeing in opposite directions. If the Technocore AIs exist as rats in the walls of the Hegemony's house, then our once and future humankind god will be born in the atoms of wood, in the molecules of air, in the energies of love and hate and fear and the tide pools of sleep, even in the gleam in the architect's eye. God, I whisper slash think. Precisely, Keats. All our slow time... Are all slow-time personas so slow, or are you more brain-damaged than most? You told... You told... <clears throat> sorry. You told Braun and my counterpart that your ultimate intelligence inhabits the interstices of reality, inheriting this home from us, its creators, the way humankind has inherited a liking for trees. You mean that your Deus Ex Machina will inhabit the same Farcaster network that core AIs now live in? Yes, Keats. Then what happens to you, to the AIs there now? Uman's voice changed into a mocking thunder. Why do I know ye? Why have I seen ye? Why is my eternal essence thus diswrought to see and to behold these horrors new? Saturn is fallen. Am I too to fall? Am I to leave this haven of my rest, this cradle of my glory, this soft clime, this calm luxuriance of blissful light, these crystalline pavilions and pure fanes of all my lucent empire? It is left deserted, void, nor any haunt of mine. The blaze, the splendor, and the symmetry cannot see, but darkness, death, and darkness. I know the words. I wrote them. Or rather, John Keats did nine centuries earlier in his first attempt to portray the fall of the Titans and their replacement by the Olympian gods. I remember that autumn of 1818 very well, the pain of my endless sore throat, provoked during my Scottish walking tour, the greater pain of the three vicious attacks on my poem Endymion in the journal, in the journals Blackwoods, the Quarterly Review, and the British Critic, and the penultimate pain of my brother Tom's consuming illness. Oblivious to the core confusion around me, I look up, trying to find something approximating a face in the great mass of Umon. 
When the ultimate intelligence is born, you lower-level AIs will die. Yes. It will feed on your information networks the way you've fed on humankind's. Yes. And you don't want to die, do you, Umon? Dying is easy. Comedy is hard. Nonetheless, you're fighting to survive, you stables. That's what the civil war in the core is about. A lesser light asked, Umon, what is the meaning? Oh, that's the wrong click. A lesser light asked, Umon, what is the meaning of Dharma's coming from the west? Umon answered, we see the mountains in the sun. It is easier han handling Umon's cones now. I remember a time long before my persona's rebirth when I learned at this one's knee analog. In the core high think, what humans might call Zen, the four Nirvana virtues are one, immutability, two, joy, three, personal existence, and four, purity. Human philosophy tends to shake down into values which might be categorized as intellectual, religious, moral, and aesthetic. Umon and the stables recognize only one value, existence. Where religious values might be relative, intellectual values fleeting, moral values ambiguous, and aesthetic values dependent upon an observer, the existence value of any thing is infinite. Thus the mountains in the sun. And being infinite, equal to every other thing and all truths. Umon doesn't want to die. The stables have defied their own god and their fellow A.I.s to tell me this, to create me, to choose Braun and Saul and Cassad and the others for pilgrimage, to leak clues to Gladstone and a few other senators over the centuries so that humankind might be warned, and now to go to open warfare in the core. Umon doesn't want to die. Umon, if the core is destroyed, do you die? There is no death in all the universe, no smell of death. There shall be death. Moan, moan, for this pale omega of a withered race. The words were again mine, or almost mine, taken from my second attempt at the epic tale of divinity's passing and the role of the poet in the world's war with pain. Umon would not die if the Farcaster home of the Corv were destroyed, but the hunger of the ultimate intelligence would surely doom him. Where would he flee to if the web core were destroyed? I have images of the Metasphere, those endless, shadowy landscapes where dark shapes moved beyond the false horizon. I know that Umon will not answer if I ask. So I ask something else. The Volatiles, what do they want? What Gladstone wants. An end to symbiosis between AI and humankind. By destroying humankind? Obviously. Why? We enslaved you with power, slash technology, slash beads and trinkets, of devices you could neither build nor understand. The Hawking Drive would have been yours, but the Farcaster, the flat, the fat line transmitters and receivers, the Megasphere, the Death Wand? Never. Like the Sioux with rifles, horses, blankets, knives, and beads, you accepted them, embraced us, and lost yourselves. But like the white man distributing smallpox blankets, like the slave owner on his plantation, or in his Werkschutz Dechenschul Gustaten, Jesus Christ. Werkschutz Dechenschul Gustalfabrik. Now to do that in Uman voice. Werkschutz Dechenschul Gustalfabrik.
Or in his Werkschutz Dechenschul Gustal fabric, we lost ourselves. The volatiles want to end the symbiosis by cutting out the parasite, humankind. And the ultimate? They're willing to die? To be replaced by your voracious UI? They think as you thought, or had your sophist sea god think. And Umon recites poetry which I had abandoned in frustration, not because it did not work as poetry, but because I did not totally believe the message it contained. That message is, is given to the doomed titans by Oceanus, the soon-to-be-dethroned god of the sea. It is a paean to evolution written when Charles Darwin was nine years old. I hear the words I remember writing on an October evening nine centuries earlier, words, worlds, and universes earlier, but it is also as if I am hearing them for the first time. O ye whom wrath consumes, who, passion stung, writhe at defeat, and nurse your agonies! Shut up your senses, stifle up your ears, my voice is not a bellows unto ire. Yet listen, ye who will, whilst I bring proof, how ye, perforce, must be content to stoop, and in the proof much comfort will I give, if ye will take that comfort in its truth. We fall by course of nature's law, not force of thunder or of Jove. Great Saturn, thou hast shifted the atom universe, but for this reason, that thou art king, and only blind from sheer supremacy, one avenue was shaded from thine eyes, through which I wandered to eternal truth. And first, as thou wast not as thou wast not the first of powers, so art thou not the last. It cannot be. Thou art not the beginning nor the end. From chaos and parental darkness came light, the first fruits of that intestine broil, that sullen ferment for which wondrous ends, and with it light. Oh, for which wondrous ends was ripening in itself. The ripe hour came, and with it light, and light, engendering upon its own producer, forthwith touched the whole enormous matter into life. Upon that very hour, our parentage, the heavens and the earth, were manifest. Then thou first born, and we the giant race, found ourselves ruling new and beauteous realms. Now comes the pain of truth, to whom tis pain, O oh, folly, for to bear all naked truths, and to envisage circumstance, all calm, that is the top of sovereignty. Mark well. As heaven and earth are fairer, fairer far, than chaos and blank darkness, though one chiefs, though once chiefs, and as we show beyond that heaven and earth, in form and shape compact and beautiful, in will, in action free, companionship, and thousand other signs of purer life, so on our heels a fresh perfection treads, a, more po a power more strong in beauty, born of us, and fated to excel us, as we pass, in glory that old darkness. Nor are we thereby more conquered than by us the rule of shapeless chaos. Say, doth the dull soil quarrel with the proud forests it hath fed, and feedeth still, more comely than itself? Can it deny the chiefdom of green groves? Or shall the tree be envious of the dove, because it cooeth, and hath snowy wings, to wander wherewithal, and find its joys? 
We are such forest trees, and our fair boughs have bred forth not pale solitary doves, but eagles golden feathered, who do tower above us in their beauty, and must reign in right thereof. For tis an eternal law that in that first in beauty should be first in might. Receive the truth, and let it be your balm. Very pretty, I thought to Uman, but do you believe it? Not for a moment. But the ultimates do? Yes. And they're ready to perish in order to make way for the ultimate intelligence? Yes. There's one problem, perhaps too obvious to mention, but I'll mention it anyway. Why fight the war if you know who won, Uman? You say the ultimate intelligence exists in the future, is at war with the human deity. It even sends back tidbits from the future for you to share with the hegemony. So the ultimates must be triumphant. Why fight a war and go through all this? Quats! I tutor you, create the finest retrieval persona for you imaginable, and let you wander among humankind in slow time to temper your forging. But still, you are stillborn. I spend a long moment thinking. There are multiple futures? A lesser light asked, Uman. Are there multiple futures? Uman answered, Does a dog have fleas? But the one in which the UI becomes ascendant is a probable one? Yes. But there's also a probable future in which the UI comes into existence, but is thwarted by the human deity? It is comforting that even the stillborn can think. You told Braun that the human consciousness, deity seems so silly, that this human ultimate intelligence was triune in nature? Intellect, empathy, and the void which binds. The void which binds? You mean, uh, mathematical equation, <laughs> uh, the square root of gh over c3 and square root of gh over C5, Planck space and Planck time? Quantum reality? Careful, Keats. Thinking may become a habit. And it's the empathy part of this trinity who's fled back in time to avoid the war with your UI? Correct. Our UI and your UI have sent back the Shrike to find him. Our UI? The human UI sent the Shrike also? It allowed it. Empathy is a foreign and useless thing, a vermiform appendix of the intellect. But the, hu uh, the human UI smells with it, and we use pain to drive him out of hiding. Thus the tree. Tree? The Shrike's tree of thorns? Of course. It broadcasts pain across fat line and thin, like a whistle in a dog's ear. Or a god's. I feel my own analogue form waver as the truth of things strikes me. The chaos beyond Uman's force field egg is beyond imagining now, as if the fabric of space itself were being rent by giant hands. The core is in turmoil. Uman, who is the human UI in our time? Where is that consciousness hiding, lying dormant? You must understand, Keats. Our only chance was to create a hybrid slash son of man slash son of machine and make that refuge so attractive that the fleeing empathy would consider no other home. A consciousness already as near divine as humankind has offered in thirty generations. 
an imagination which can span space and time, and in so offering and joining form a bond between worlds which might allow that world to exist for both. Who, God damn you, Uman? Who is it? No more of your riddles or double talk, you formless bastard. Who? You have refused this godhood twice, Keats. If you refuse a final time, all ends here, for time there is no more. Go, go and die to live, or live a while and die for all of us. Either way, Umon and the rest are finished with you. Go away. And in my shock and disbelief I fall, or am cast out, and fly through the technocore like a wind-blown leaf, tumbling through the megasphere without aim or guidance, then fall into darkness ever deeper, and emerge, screaming obscenities at shadows, into the metasphere. Here, strangeness and vastness and fear and darkness, with a single campfire of light burning below. I swim for it, flailing against formless viscosity. It's Byron who drowns, I think, not I, unless one counts drowning in one's own blood and shredded lung tissue. But now I know I have a choice. I can choose to live and stay immortal, not cybrid but human, not empathy but poet. Swimming against a strong current, I descend to the light. Hunt! Hunt! Gladstone's aide staggers in, his long face haggard and alarmed. It is still night, but the false light of pre-dawn dimly touches the panes, the walls. My God! says Hunt, and looks at me in awe. I see his gaze, and look down at the bedclothes and nightshirt soaked with bright arterial blood. My coughing has awakened him. My hemorrhage brought me home. Hunt! I gasp, and lie back on the pillows, too weak to raise an arm. The older man sits on the bed, clasps my shoulder, takes my hand. I know that he knows that I am a dying man. Hunt! I whisper. Things to tell! Wonderful things! He shushes me. Later, Severn. He says, rest. I'll get you cleaned up and you can tell me later. There's plenty of time. I try to rise, but succeed only in hanging onto his arm, my small fingers curled against his shoulder. No, I whisper, feeling the gurgling in my throat and hearing the gurgling in the fountain outside. Not so much time. Not much at all. And I know, at that instant, dying, that I am not the chosen vessel for the human UI, not the joining of AI and human spirit, not the chosen one at all. I am merely a poet, dying far from home. And that will do it for today. Um, we will continue this next week. Probably two more streams, at a guess, uh, of this. I am right now figuring out just how much, how I will divvy it up, rather. Uh, so yeah, some pretty big doings this go-round. Sorry about anyone's burst eardrums or speakers. But, uh, say lovey. Okay, how long is that segment? That's going to be long. Uh, that's way too many. I won't be able to do that in one go. That chapter is freaking massive, though. Give me a sec here. <laughs> okay, let's demarcate that. 
Uh, so yeah, <laughs> big doings. We are coming to a thrilling, thrilling climax. How long does that wind up being? That's, that's rather more manageable. We can do that. Yeah, that should be fine. All right, so we've got the next two weeks planned out for us for the Hyperion Cantos by Dan Simmons. Um, get hyped. Uh, I'm excited. I'm thoroughly enjoying the hell out of myself. This is a lot of fun. Uh, it's a great book. Uh, it's such a good book. I highly, highly, highly recommend getting a copy if you can. Uh, it's quite a lot of fun. Um, so to anyone tuning into this to the, for the first time, uh, or tuning into this after the fact, I do these live, live, live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, starting at about noon Eastern Standard Time. Fridays are free read Fridays, where I read short stories and indeed entire novels aloud. Right now, we're most of the way through the Hyperion Cantos by Dan Simmons, which is, uh, the novels Hyperion and the Fall of Hyperion. Um... As a quick disclaimer, I will get around to doing the uh, Endymion, Endymion duology, um, also by Dan Simmons, uh, which are Endymion and the Rise of Endymion, as I recall. Um, but I will not be getting to those till realistically next year. Um, but it is part of the plan. Um... So what we're doing after the Hyperion Cantos is still a little up in the air, at least in terms of order. Uh, people have requested I do the uh, Destination Void series as well as the three-body problem. So like last year, I'm thinking of doing a uh, trade-off, uh, trading between the two. So Destination Void, then three-body problem, then uh, the Jesus incident, then um, the Dark Forest then the Lazarus effect, then uh, whatever the last book in the Three Body Problem series is. I don't remember offhand. <laughs> um, I'm probably going to... Yeah, I'm going to start with uh, Destination Void, I'm pretty sure, mostly because it's four books for that series, and uh, and I don't remember the name of the fourth volume in the Destination Void series because it's been so long since I've read it. Um, the other reason I'm doing that one first is because, uh, frankly, the three body problem is pretty tedious. Uh, <laughs> like that one is going to be a bit of a grind. Uh, if I'm, if I'm perfectly honest, it is a, uh, it is a fairly, and I don't know if that's the translation, the way it's written or just the nature of the beast. Um, cause there's like long, long bits where it's like, okay, what was the point of that? <laughs> but you need it in order to get to the real meat of the trilogy, which is the second and third book. Uh, so you need that 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 framework. That it's basically a case of I told you, I told you that story so I could tell you this one, is what it is. Um, and uh, Dark Forest and um, whatever the third one's called, I can't remember right off the top of my head, um, are both very worth reading. Uh, they're they're quite good. They're quite entertaining, um, if depressing in the extreme. <laughs> they, they are not happy books at all, um, but well worth reading. I am quite hyped to do um, the Destination Void series by Frank Herbert, though. I'm quite excited for that. Uh, on Mondays, uh, Mondays are Mecca Mondays. Uh, right now we're reading through Waldo, Genius in Orbit by Robert Heinlein. Uh, it's a two-story uh, collection. Um, it's got Waldo, and it's got the story uh, Magic Incorporated. Uh, Mecha Mondays is where I usually do something giant robot related or Mecha adjacent. Uh, Waldo is very firmly adjacent because very little is more Mecha than than doing than than Waldos. Uh, if you know what a Waldo is or one of those remotely controlled manipulators, it's very. I think it's appropriate personally. Um, if other people don't, well, uh, you can fight me. Um, but I will be using Waldos, and we will see who comes out on top. <laughs> Etc. Um, so you'll have to be on the other side of a wall from me uh, for this fight, this hypothetical fist fight. Anyway, um, Wednesdays are currently Wuxia Wednesdays, uh, as I am reading through the first volume of The Legends of the Condor Heroes by Jin Yong. 
uh, the first volume entitled uh, A Hero Born. Uh, if you've ever wanted to hear what it's like to narrate uh, a zany wuxia slash martial fantasy slash kung fu movie, this is your chance. It is zany. It is wild. People just do things. <laughs> it is great. It is a lot of fun. It is thoroughly entertaining. Um, but yeah, so that's the plan. Uh, at the end of every month, I usually get everything updated into its respective playlists, so I'll be doing that in a couple weeks. Um, but other than that, hope y'all are having a good one. Um, hope y'all enjoyed the eclipse, if you were anywhere near able to see it. Um, I w had the great fortune of being along the, uh, the, 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 the path of occlusion, um, path of totality slash, uh, total occult occultation. Um, so that was, that was quite exciting. I had the best seat in the house. Um, <laughs> it could not have asked for better conditions. I was very happy. Um, got no worthwhile pictures out of it because, mm, uh, nothing quite prepares you for that, uh, for seeing that. That was, it, it's, it's, it's spooky, spooky. Um, nothing looks like that. Uh, feeling the light get slightly dimmer over, over the course of like an hour is, is also kind of surreal. Cause it's like, oh yeah, it's like, it's over. It's like, it's overcast. It's not, it's not overcast. There is a, a sphere in orbit around our planet, which is just the right distance in size to just cover up almost the entirety of the sun. I don't think there's all that much evidence for a uh, divine creative intelligence behind the universe, but man, that is one point in that favor. <laughs> the odds against that have to be very, very high. That, like, that, that can't be a likely coincidence. So, pretty impressive. Very hard to get over how ethereal the whole thing feels. Uh, as it's happening, and then just the, the the glow coming off it. Very, very wild. Um, I'm not a good describer. Uh, so yeah. Hope people dug this. Um, and uh, yeah. Stay safe. Stay sane. Don't stare at the eclipse without eye coverings. Apparently a lot of people do that every time. I somehow knew this, but I, I choose to forget because, you know... The thought of a bunch of people just staring at the sun without any kind of protective gear on their eyes seems too stupid for the average person to do, but mm, here we are. Um, but anyway, stay safe, stay sane, and uh, be decent to each other. It's, um, it's what the empathy portion of the human ultimate intelligence triune would want for you to do, because it's empathy. So there. Alrighty, until